Good evening, everyone. My name is Russell Peck, and I am the president of Delta Sigma Pi. And my name is Madison Hacker, and I'm the president of Mortarboard National Honor Society. And we would like to welcome you today to this evening's last lecture event featuring President Maxwell. Uh, before we welcome the president to the stage, uh, just a few housekeeping announcements here. Uh, just to kind of give you a flow as to how the event will work tonight. To start us off, President Maxwell will give us a uh, few brief remarks and uh, we'll then proceed to the question and answer portion of the event where we've gotten questions from you through the hashtag and also several other questions that we've heard from the community. And finally, we will conclude with a question and answer session uh, featuring questions from you. So do be thinking about questions as we go along uh, this evening. And uh, we ask that you raise your hand if you have any questions uh, in our third part of the session. And I'm not sure we'll bring the microphone to you. Before we begin, we'd like to give you a little bit of background about our 2015 last lecture speaker. David Maxwell, PhD, has been president of Drake University since May of 1999 and holds a faculty appointment as professor of literature. He was director of the National Foreign Language Center in Washington, D.C. from 1993 to 1999 after serving as president of Whitman College from 1989 to 1993. Dr. Maxwell was at Tufts University from 1971 to 1989 as a faculty member in Russian language and literature and served as dean of undergraduate students from 1981 to 1989. Dr. Maxwell earned his bachelor's degree in Russian area studies from Grinnell College in 1966. He received his master's and doctorate degrees in Slavic languages and literatures from Brown University in 1968 and 1974 respectively. Dr. Maxwell is a member of the Executive Committee of the Business and Higher Education Forum. He has served on the boards of directors of the American Council on Education, the Association of American Colleges and Universities, and the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities. He currently serves on the board of directors of the Council on Higher Education Accreditation. Dr. Maxwell is a member of the Higher Education Working Group on Global Issues of the Council on Foreign Relations and the National Leadership Council of AACNU's Liberal Education for America's Promise Initiative. On July 1st, 2015, Dr. Maxwell will become a Senior Fellow of the Association of Governing Boards. In 2011, Dr. Maxwell received the Chief Executive Leadership Award from District 6, Council for Advancement and Support of Education. In 2012, he received the A. Arthur Davis Distinguished Community Leadership Award from the Greater Des Moines Leadership Institute, the Robert D. Ray Pillar Character Award from Character Counts in Iowa, and the President's Award from Region 4 East of the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators. In 2014, Dr. Maxwell was the first college university president inducted into the Iowa Business Hall of Fame. In 2015, he was named Person of the Year by the Chinese Association of Iowa. Dr. Maxwell is married to Madeline Molly Maxwell, a former creative director. Maddie is also with us in the audience today, and we would like to take this opportunity to thank her for the, her continued support of the Drake community and the impact that she has had on the lives of Drake students. Thoughts. 
because this is, after all, my last lecture, right? <laughs> so, the two thoughts I want to leave you with are, are number one, and again, drawing from my own experience, uh, are the importance of mentors and, and role models in your, in your lives. And I know that you as Drake students, uh, I, I don't have to tell you that because I know that your experience with your faculty and staff at Drake, uh, that you have mentors and, and role models. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about who the most important ones are for me because the other thing I'm going to tell you are the things that I think define me. And by that I mean the things that worry me and the things I care about. And I care about the things that worry me also, but the things I care about are a little more positive. So I want to give you a little bit of a sense of where that came from, because it, it came from other people, and it came from, from people in my lives. And, and the first was my father, who was, uh, as I think many of you know, well, you saw him up there holding me when I was three months old or so. I mean, he was, my dad was a very famous jazz trumpet player. Uh, he was very well known and, and considered the best first trumpet player in the country for about 30 years. And uh, um, when I think about what I learned from him, it was more by being part of his life than what he actually said. Uh, I grew up in a house full of music and a house full of books. Uh, there was just music all the time. Uh, and my dad was only either practicing or had friends over and they were playing, or I was in recording studios in New York or TV stages, and, and so I was just surrounded by music all of the time. And when my father passed away in 2002, he had about 20,000 books in the house. Uh, and, and so I grew up with that, that environment in which two of the most important things in the world were music and books, and that was just a huge influence. Um, the next person who had a, a really important uh, impact on my life, uh, I'm not sure I ever got back to him to tell him how important it was, but I've been invoking his name for decades. Uh, when I was 17 years old, instead of uh, going to my high school graduation in the senior prom, I went to the Soviet Union for seven weeks with my father and the Benny Goodman Band, and I was the band boy. It was the first time an American jazz band had ever been behind the Iron Curtain. This was in 1962, and it was a really, really big deal. Uh, we were followed by media everywhere. We met Khrushchev. It was really quite remarkable. And there was a guy named Terry Katherman who was the um, cultural affairs officer at the embassy, uh, and, uh, and he was sort of our shepherd through this uh, seven-week tour. And uh, the band rehearsed every afternoon that we weren't traveling, so I would set up the music stands and put the music out there and then sit in the, in the auditorium with Terry while the band was rehearsing and talking to him. And by the time I came home, I wanted to be him. Uh, this is the middle of the Cold War, and Kennedy and Khrushchev were threatening each other with bombs and missiles. And here was this guy in Moscow who was sending the Bolshoi Ballet to New York and bringing the Benny Goodman Band to the Soviet Union. And I thought that was a much better way to deal with things. So I wrote him a letter when I was a freshman at Grinnell. And I said, if I want to be, do what you do, what should I major in? And he said, he wrote back, and he said, learn everything you can. You never know what you're going to have to deal with in this job. But I set out, I became a Russian area studies major at Grinnell because I wanted to be Terry Catherman. Um, and then two things happened when I was a senior. One was that by my senior year, the diplomatic corps was spending most of its time trying to explain to the world why we were in Southeast Asia, and I didn't really agree with the explanation. I had, after all, gone to Grinnell, right? Uh, <laughs> and, um, but also, I had this wonderful honors thesis advisor, this wonderful man named Dick Sheldon, and he called me up one day early on, second or third week of my senior year at Grinnell, and he said, come on over for coffee with Karen and me. I have an observation I want to share with you. And I went over and he said, you know, he said, when you're talking about your Russian area studies was history, economics, politics, um, and language and lit. And he said, you know, when you're talking about your work for history and politics and economics, you're referring to it as the homework. And I said, yeah. And he said, and here's my literature professor. He said, when you're talking about the work for my class, you're talking about the reading. And he said, I just wonder if there's any significance in your choice of vocabulary. And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, yeah, I raced through the homework to get to the reading. I really love the reading. And this wonderful man looked at me, and he said, if you go to graduate school, you can keep reading. And that's why I applied to graduate school, to keep reading. This was 1966, or 65, the fall of 65. 20-year-old males in the fall of 65 did not have a whole lot of options. Uh, that involved not getting shot at. And uh, um, 
So we decided that it applied to the top five Slavic languages and literature programs in the country that had a particular emphasis on 19th century. And if I got into one of them with money, with fellowship or scholarship support, I'd go. And I got into the number one program in the country. And uh, so off I went, thanks to Dick Sheldon. And while I was at Brown, within weeks, there were two people, Tom Winter, who was the chair of the department, who asked me to be his research assistant two weeks after I got there, uh, and a wonderful man named Steve Lockridge, who was a brilliant teacher and a wonderful scholar, young guy, and all the women students were, had huge crushes on him, so I wanted to be Steve. <laughs> uh, but I looked at these two people, and I looked at what their lives were, both of whom were mentoring me and sort of had embraced me to, to help me learn, and thought, what a wonderful job. You get to read books that you love and write about them and sit in the classroom and talk with smart young people about them. This is a great job. Two more to go, and then I'll get into the list. The next one was Maddie and I spent, so I did four years at Brown, uh, and then passed my doctoral laurels, and then I had to go write my dissertation. And I got a Fulbright Fellowship to spend a year in Moscow uh, doing the research for my dissertation. So Maddie and I went on a poor man, and we've been married for two years, and I dragged her off. The Soviet Union in 1970 was not a really terrific place to live. Um, but we had an amazing experience. It was a life-changing experience. And there was a wonderful, wonderful man named Mikhail Petrovich Gromov. He was the Soviet Union's leading Chekhov scholar. And Chekhov was the writer, the playwright and short story writer about whom I was passionate. And he and his wife adopted us. We had dinner at their house two or three times a week for 10 months. Um, and before dinner, um, Maddie would sit with Mikhail Petrovich, who was also a, a world, he had won the year All-European Photo Prize. And so they would talk about art, which is one of the ways Maddie learned how to speak Russian fairly quickly, because he didn't speak English. And I would sit in the kitchen peeling potatoes for his wife, and, and she was the deputy director of the Institute of World Literature, the Academy of Sciences. So, she and I would talk, then we'd have dinner together, and then I would go into Mikhail Petrovich's study with him, and we would close the door, and he would pour some glasses of the horrible Georgian cognac, um, and we would talk about literature. And I learned more from Mikhail Petrovich and his study uh, in those 10 months than I had for four years in graduate school. Not because my four years in graduate, I couldn't have done it without those four years in graduate school, but this was a one-on-one -on -one seminar uh, with a guy who could quote passages from Chekhov by heart. Um, and it was just remarkable to give me a sense of what you can do when you really, really love what you do. And the final one's a guy that I just saw last December. He's now 80 years old, and he's in his final year at Tufts, where I was for 18 years. And he was my boss for the whole time I was at Tufts. He was my department chair. Um, and he was the chair of the Department of German, which had three people teaching Russian in it when I arrived. And, it soon got changed to German and Russian, and eventually we had a program in Russian that I chaired, but Saul was my boss. And then after 10 years, I walked into his office one day, and uh, by that time, we had moved next door to him. He was my baseball partner, my tennis partner, um, was very much my mentor, um, and uh, uh, I walked into his office one morning. I was on sabbatical at Harvard, and uh, I, I came out to the campus, and I went to Saul's office, and I said, well, I'm finally out from under your thumb, Saul. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, the president asked me to be dean of, uh, dean of the academic dean, dean of the college this morning. And he said, what time? I said, what, what time? What do you mean, what time? What does it matter? He said, what time, David? And I said, 10 o'clock. And he said, OK, 9 o'clock, he asked me to be the provost. I'm still your boss. <laughs> and he was. And he was the provost at Tusk for 21 years. Okay? But Saul gave me one really good bit of advice. One night when the kids were probably one and three and a half, and we had dinner, and then I had gone back upstairs to my study on the third floor because I was determined to be the best teacher and the best Chekhov scholar in the world, and that's what I was focused on. And Saul shows up in front of my, I think was still a typewriter at that point, an IBM is electric, and shows up on the other side with in wet, stinking tennis clothes, and he looked at me and says, everybody I know has got two books out by the age of 40 is divorced, and turned around and left. And I sat there thinking, what was that? Oh, right, I have a family. <laughs> and downstairs I went. But those people saw, and I also spent most of my career at Tufts wanting to be Saul. 
He was a great teacher. He had 300 students in his courses. Everybody on campus knew who he was because of how good he was. And so those are the people that, that shaped and, and still inform my life. But I also want to tell you that I'm really fortunate in that the people in my life came together with my scholarly passion because in some ways my most enduring mentors are some dead 19th century Russian authors, okay? uh, particularly Chekhov and, and Dostoevsky, the author of Crime and Punishment and Brothers Karamazov. Not only were they the subjects of my teaching and my scholarly research, but quite frankly, in many ways, they're my sacred texts. They're the texts that informed my beliefs and informed my worldview. I learned from them, and I continue to learn from them. And here's the other message then, and it comes from Dostoevsky. And I have to be careful because and Dostoevsky had a huge influence on me. He was also a rapidly conservative, anti-Semitic, mean old man. So we have to keep that in mind, but he was a brilliant writer. Uh, and wrote some of the most remarkable novels in, in all of Western literature. And he's often described as the forerunner to existentialism. Uh, and he is because of his emphasis on the fact that you define who you are as a human being by what you think, by what you believe in, and how you act on what you think and what you believe in, that the choices that you make on the basis of your values and your beliefs and what you believe in are the things that define you in a, as a human being. And that's a fundamental concept, eventually, of, of existentialism, and I really learned that from Dostoevsky. So that's the other thought. I want to leave with you, and that is to urge you to be reflective and introspective and figure out who you are by identifying what it is you believe in, who it is, what it is you care about, what it is you want to do, and to, to act on those convictions. Um, ultimately, those actions and your words define who you are. So let me head towards the, the premise close by giving you a list of those things that I think define me. And I'll try to be as brief as I can because I want to get to the, the conversation and the questions and answers. The first list is the things I worry about, and the second list is the things I care about. And the first list is going to be probably a little bit depressing, uh, but it's not meant to be. It's meant to be a challenge to all of us to do something about these things. I want to point out before I get into this list that the human race has failed to live up to my expectations for 70 years. Okay. So, I've also failed to live up to my expectations, so I'm not being a hypocrite, at least. So, let me tell you the things that really worry me, that, I, that I'm concerned about. We're destroying our planet, and I'm amazed that there are people who don't believe that, and who don't think we need to do anything about it. We, I'm worried about the fact that we live in an age in which assertion and belief seem to have the same currency as knowledge and fact. Let me say that again. A world in which assertion and belief seem to have gained the same currency as knowledge and fact. We're denying science. We're denying demonstrable, provable fact. You don't really get to not believe in facts, okay? Extremism and fundamentalism of any kind worry me, no matter what, how just the cause itself is, and the intolerance we seem to have of people who think differently than we do. The belief that if you think differently I, than I do, that you're an idiot and a spawn of the devil by virtue of that fact. That people of a variety of faiths who believe that for some reason they have a God-given mandate to make me believe what they believe, instead of granting me the autonomy to explore my own beliefs and my own spirituality. And the worst of that is something that's a fascinating a neurobio neuroscientist named Sam Harris, who at one point said, we're killing each other over whose books were written by God. That worries me. Income equality worries me. The top 1% of the people in this country have 25% of the income in this country, and it's getting worse. Abandoning the people who live in our inner cities to inadequate services and underperforming schools and a cycle of poverty and violence, that worries me. The failure of the U.S. education system to prepare people for work or for post-secondary education. 
Now, having said that, you obviously all got good education, so you wouldn't be here. But as a system, it's not a system. It's 14,000 school districts that have autonomy in 50 states that have autonomy. And as a nation, it's failing us. The epidemic of sexual violence on the nation's college and university campuses worries me. The loss of civility in public discourse and the policy and the media that screaming and insulting seem to have taken the place of conversation. And that's compounded by social media. And, and well, social media obviously has many positive impacts. Social media has also become an outlet for autonomous, uh, anonymous insults, for slander and misinformation. The political polarization of American public and our legislative bodies worries me a lot. Plus the nefarious influence of money that the wealthy now decide who gets elected in this country. And I'm truly afraid that American democracy is becoming dysfunctional. The decline in respect for language. You heard me talk about the importance of language in books at the beginning. Language is important and how you use it is important. It can be tremendously expressive and have tremendous meaning. And I guess I'm old fashioned and cranky enough to wish that people paid more attention to the elegance that language can have. <coughs> this will another be another old cranky guy um, comment, but uh, I can promise you that never in my life have I watched a reality show. Okay? But Maddie and I seem to be in the demographic of the people who watch reruns of Crim Criminal Minds, NCIS, and Law and & Order. And those channels advertise. They have teasers for reality shows all the time. And quite frankly, those reality shows and the behavior I see in public really makes me wonder if civilization has advanced much past the 14th century. Uh, I am... I am <laughs> I am continually amazed and, and disheartened, really, by the lack of human dignity, by the narcissism, by the selfishness, by the rudeness, by the sense of entitlement. It worries me. So, now that I've ruined your evening, I'm totally depressed all of you. Right? Let me try to elevate th you know, things a little bit by telling you some of the things that are really important that I, I believe in and I care about. Now, obviously, the things that I just said worry me, I care deeply about. But these are the things that, I, that I'm about to say that really define me for, for who I am. Uh, in spite of everything I just said, I have a deep belief in human potential and our capacity to make things better. And I can tell you that that belief is reinforced on a daily basis by you. That's why I have that faith, is because of you. I believe in the importance of truth. It's ultimately the most sacred of things for an academic. It should be the most sacred of things for everyone. And I care about integrity. Somebody wonderfully defined integrity as doing the right thing when nobody's watching. But I'd also add remaining true to your core principles and your core values, especially when it's hard. I care about accountability. You are what, as Dostoevsky said, you are what you say and what you do, and you have to hold yourself accountable for it. I have tr tremendous belief in the diversity of the human community, diversity in every possible form, which should be cause for celebration, not fear and discrimination. I believe in and care about the power and nobility of language. I care about the constant human desire to learn more and understand more. I care about placing the other before the self, making sure that it was worth it that you were here on earth, that something was better because you were here. And in that vein, the notion of service, of contributing to the common good, of holding yourself accountable for the welfare of your community. And not surprisingly, given what I've said about books and language, I have a tremendous place, a tremendous value in the power of narratives, the power of stories, whether they're fictional stories or other people's real stories. But by immersing yourself in the narratives, in the narratives of the other, you expand your experience as a human being. You get to live other lives. You get to go other places. You get to think other things. You get to see other things. Your experience expands dramatically just by immersing yourself in stories. 
And clearly, thanks to my father, I place tremendous value in music. Um, there are times when I'm listening to music that time disappears. Um, you know, the music that I really love, and I love almost all kinds of music, but there are times when I listen to music that I really disappear into intergalactic space. It takes me other places, and I have this tremendous fascination with, um, with sound that our older son inherited. He does electronic music. He's a, he works at Google, but if you want to hear his stuff, you can buy it on iTunes. Justin Maxwell. <laughs> he's really good. Um, he's also the lead designer on Android Auto at Google, so he has a day job, which is good. Um, but the power of sounds, the, 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 the ability of sound, of musical sounds, to transport you. Um, there was a time when I was in graduate school, I think it was, uh, um, the, it was right before, the year before Maddie and I got married, and I was driving back from, from campus to my apartment, uh, with two of my colleagues, we're sort of a study group, and um, Heidi and Nancy, I can't believe I just remembered their names, and we're driving, I had the radio on, and there was this song that was this huge hit at the time by Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels, okay? Um, and, and there's a note in that song, this one guitar note, that it's, you know, the guy's playing a wonderful solo, and he leads up to this, just jams the string up and bends it about three tones, and it's just beautiful, and, and I could just hear that note, and I, 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 they thought I was crazy. You know, we're driving down the street, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you have to hear, hear this note, and I pulled over so that they didn't get, because it was a, a convertible, and I pulled over so that they could hear this note on the radio. They looked at me like I was nuts, right? <laughs> but that is, for me, the power of music, and uh, um, I got a new guitar when we were in Maine a couple years ago, and. I was down in, in my study and, and, and sort of learning it, and, and Madeline came down and asked me what I was doing. Um, because apparently I was sitting there and just playing a note. And then a couple of minutes later I play another note. She thought I had a stroke or something. I was just, I was just listening to the notes it could make. And, and for me, that music has such an incredible power. I care deeply about the power of science and scientific inquiry. That science, when it's applied properly, can improve the human condition. Science can prevent diseases, it can cure diseases, it can address climate change, it can feed the growing global population, and it also satisfies a fundamental human need to know more, to know the big questions about how everything in the universe works and why it works that way. It's a basic human, kind of, uh, it's a basic human curiosity, a basic human need. And finally, I do believe in education as an enterprise. It's what I've devoted my life to. And I think there's a purity in what we do. I think there's a nobility of purpose in what we do. So this has been very rapid fire. So let me just come back around to where I started and remind you of the two messages. And then we're gonna go sit down and have a conversation. Figure out who you're gonna learn from. Real people who you know and the text, the narratives that you can immerse yourself in. And figure out who you are and who you wanna be by identifying your core values, your core beliefs, and make sure that your words and your actions remain true to those values and those beliefs because ultimately they define who you are. So thank you, and we're going to go sit down and have a conversation.
just thank you so much, President Mitchell, for your remarks. Um, as you all know, now we'll proceed to the question and answer session. So thank you to all of you for submitting questions via the hashtag. Um, and so President Mitchell, we'll just get right into it and ask you the first question. Uh, so the first question is, what is one great accomplishment, uh, or some of them, that you are proud of in your past 16 years here at Drake? Okay. Well, there's a lot. And, and the first thing I want to make clear is um, there is a, 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 an illness or a mental condition that is uh, epidemic among people in my profession and among college and university presidents. Uh, and that is that they lose first person plural pronouns um, and everything becomes I did this and my that. And I didn't do anything, we did. You know, for the last 16 years, I've had the, the privilege of being part of an amazing team of 850 people who I think their, their primary goal every day when they show up at work is to make me look like I know what I'm doing. Um, but it really is a team effort. And, but as I look back at the, the last 16 years about the really significant changes at Drake that I think we should all be proud of, I, I guess I list four, and I could probably list 30, but I'm, I'm going to stick to four big ones. One is that, as some of you may know, but a lot of you probably don't, that when Maddie and I got here in 1999, Drake was in a very good shape uh, and had a $7 million operating deficit, $70 million in deferred maintenance, uh, declining enrollments. Um, uh, we were in the middle of a $190 million fundraising drive that was kind of stole. So you can see where I won't have the job. Right? And so, and, uh, but it is kind of where I won't have the job, because I'm, I'm, I'm actually a horrible manager. I don't like to run things. I like to create things and fix things and, and, and make things happen. Uh, so I think one of the most important things we did is that we took Drake from a, uh, an institution that was really struggling for a variety of reasons and, and turned it into the remarkably vibrant institution that it is now uh, and that is recognized nationally for, for what it is. And if there's anything I personally brought to that process because I was from the outside, because I was a fresh look and a, and a new look at this, is is what I heard when I when I got to Drake from a lot of people was, how do we get back to where we were? You know, Drake was great a couple of years ago. How do we get back to where we were? Uh, and what I said, no, no, where we have to, where are we going? No, we don't want to get back to where we were. We want to get to where we're going. Um, and and to really begin a series of strategic conversations about what do we want Drake to look like in five years? What do we want Drake to look like in ten years? What do we want Drake to look like in fifteen years? And the remarkable thing for this community is, this is what we wanted it to look like. You know, we did it, uh, and it really was hundreds of people. Uh, it was really becoming strategic in our decision making and mission driven in our decision making. So I think that's certainly one of the things that this whole campus has to be proud of. Um, the second is our emphasis on, on global and international. I'll tell you a very quick, funny story. So, so when I was the first round of interviews, uh, when I was a candidate for this job, uh, they flew me out to Kansas City, and I, I met with the search committee in the hotel conference room near Kansas City Airport. If my memory is correct, there were about 340 people around the around the room. It was, it was probably 20, but it just was it was, it was kind of intimidating. And, uh, and, and they asked all kinds of questions. And I'd been a college president before. I kind of knew what to expect. And, uh, and at the end, as any good search committee would do, they said, well, do you have any questions for us? And I had about four pages of single, single space bullets. And, uh, and, and one of the top ones, I said, well, you know, I want to talk a little bit about global and international, because this is something that colleges and universities are really foregrounding now. You know my background. I was I chaired the Soviet American Educational Exchange. I was the vice chair of the board of the Council on International Educational Exchange. I'm the director of the National Foreign Language Center. This stuff's important to me, and I'm just surprised by the lack of mention of global and international in Drake's materials. And Ron Troyer, a wonderful guy who was dean of arts and sciences at the time, became provost in my second year and survived that with me for nine years. Wonderful guy. Um, he said, well, you know, he said, global and international is such an ingrained part of Drake's fabric that we don't feel that we need to talk about it a lot and brag about it like other institutions do. Okay. Um, a week after I was appointed to this job and I was still in, in Washington, uh, Ron called me up and he said, do you remember your question about global and international? I said, yeah. And he said, do you remember my answer? And I said, yeah. He said, you know, it's a crop, don't you? We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> and we 
did it. Now, I am going to Washington in two weeks to be the keynote speaker for the fourth or fifth time at the American Council on Education's Internationalization Workshop. They ask me to come do that every year because we are a model for higher education with the Principal Center for Global Citizenship, with everything that Krista Olson and Gretchen and Anik and the whole team are doing that, that really to make global and international pervasive and, and live up to that mission promise of a responsible global citizenship. Um, and then finally, um, I think one of the things we should be really proud of is that Drake is now a fixture on the national higher education landscape. You know, we are no longer that really good small university somewhere in the Midwest that, yeah, it's great. Um, we are, you know, as, as you heard in that litany that <laughs> Madison read off that, you know, I've been on the board of directors of the American Council on Education, the Association of American Colleges, the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, the Council on Higher Education Accreditation, not because I'm a hotshot, it's because I'm the president of Drake. They want Drake at the table. Um, and, and, and that stature is when, when uh, Marty Martin and I were at the American Council of Education's annual meetings in D.C. a couple of, about a month ago, and, and our folks had set up interviews and meetings for Marty. I wanted him to meet all of the higher education leadership of these associations that I've been working with for years, but he also met with the editors of the Chronicle of Higher Education and Inside Higher Ed, the two major higher ed newspapers. And he came away from that and said, wow, I said, I don't have to, t they all know about Drake. They all know that Drake's a big deal, and and that's really a big deal. Not just not not as a pride point, and of course we're proud of it, but it's one of the reasons that we attract the best faculty from all over the country, and it's one of the reasons we attract the best students from all over the country and all over the world because we have become an institution of national stature, and I think that means a lot for us. Um, if you could go back and do your presidency all over again, is there anything that you would do differently? knowing now, or knowing then what you know now? This is where you have to admit your mistakes in public, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the upsides or downsides of this job is that my mistakes are all public, right? They're just scary. They're all right where everybody can see them. Um, you know, one of the things I would love to do, and I'm only saying this somewhat facetiously, is I would love to figure out a way to have a thicker skin. Um, you know, everybody's got, you know, this is, I think, the only job more visible than this is being a basketball coach, right? Um, but, you know, everybody's got an opinion on what you're doing, and most of my colleagues learn to let that bounce off them, and, and I don't. I really take it seriously, and it, I think it makes me better at my job, but it, uh, but I'd say there were two things, there were two big things that, that I wish we had done differently. Um, one was our infamous deep loss campaign. <laughs> yeah, so you all know about it. And I have to tell you that, that what was really, what went wrong with that was that um, when Deb Lucart and the University Communications team and the consultants came in and said, we've got a really high risk proposal for you. And the U was Tom Delaware, the Vice President for Admission and Student Financial Planning. And, and, I, and he said, and she said, this is really edgy and, and, and high risk. We want to know what you think of it. Uh, and they laid out this campaign. For those of you who don't know what it is, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a view book, and it had the big Drake D in blue on the cover with a plus sign next to it. D plus, right? And you opened it up, and this theme was Drake's this plus your that. You know, Drake's faculty plus your passion. Drake's. It was a wonderful format, right? And and it was ironic, right? You know, it was, you know, why would they put D plus on the cover and you open it up? Oh, that's why. And they tested it with focus groups of 960 college-bound high school seniors. And they loved it, okay? And they focused, tested it with, with guidance counselors, and they loved it. So we did it, okay? And it worked, right? We had a 25 or 30% increase in campus visits. We had a dramatic increase in applications. What we didn't think about was two things. One is, it really pissed off the faculty and our alums, right? <laughs> who were not the target audience for this thing, right? You know, but they didn't think it was as wonderfully as ironic as the 18-year-olds did. Um, but the other thing was that somebody
took, we had this on the website also, and if you looked at it on the web, the D plus showed up for literally half a second, and then it went into the Drake's faculty plus your passion, Drake's opportunities plus your aspirations, et cetera. It's a wonderful theme. But somebody took a screenshot of just the D plus and posted it on a blog on Yahoo about how dumb it was, and that went viral. So we had tens of thousands of people criticizing us for doing this when all they saw was that screenshot. They had no idea what, what the campaign was really about and the fact that it was working, right? But we did learn something from that, and that is that when you're gonna do something edgy, figure out who the other possible audiences are. You know, we didn't think about, let's talk to the faculty and make sure they're okay with this. Let's try it out on some just to make sure they're okay with this. So it was a learning experience. Um, uh, and the other one was more recent. Um, we, uh, uh, I stood up in front of faculty groups about two years ago and said, uh, you know, I think, I think there's a good chance we're spending too much money running ourselves, too much money in, in administrative operations. Uh, and, and we need to be able to, to look our students and their families in the eye and say, I promise you that the greatest part of every dollar, that first of all, we're using every dollar you give us as efficiently and effectively as possible, and that the greatest part of every dollar is, is applied directly to the student's learning experience, not to running the place. We need to be efficient and effective, and I don't have the evidence to make that promise. I think we need to do an administrative program review. We need to take a really close look at it. And the prospect of that, not surprisingly, is anxiety inducing for staff because it means some people's jobs may change or some people's jobs may disappear. Um, and we hired a consultant to do that and he did it really badly. Um, and as the end result was that we kind of tyrannized the campus for about a year, um, which is one of the things that gave rise to the grumpy survey in the fall was, was that the campus was tyrannized by this, this thing going badly. Uh, and I really take the blame for not, I, somebody else was, in, was the liaison with that consultant and it should have been me. Uh, and I should have fired him in two months. Um, and so when I look back at that and sort of, you know, we created a lot of anxiety and a lot of concern on campus and I really wish we hadn't because what we're trying to do is in your interest, we're trying to make sure that we're operating efficiently and effectively. And uh, uh, so those are two of the, two of the bigger ones. The rest of them have managed to hide. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so going to a more uh, light-hearted question. Um, what is your funniest, oddest, or most memorable moment in Drake? Okay. I can give you two funny ones and one memorable one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, one of the first ones was that there used to be a, uh, a thing that the cheerleaders did at, at, at basketball games. And they had a doghouse on, on wheels. Okay? And, and during, during uh, timeouts or, or halftime, they'd bring this doghouse out and, and they'd wheel it around and do all kinds of cheerleader kinds of things. And then Spike would jump out of the doghouse. Right? And so one time, and, and there were two of the guys who were cheerleaders during the basketball season were, were football players. They were big defensive linemen who could lift people up in the air. Um, and uh, they convinced me to surprise everybody by being the person in the doghouse. <laughs> and they thought it'd be really funny to spin it around in circles about 400 times. <laughs> so, from the spectator's point of view, that was a really funny moment. From, from my point of view, that was the closest I ever came to vomiting in public. <laughs>
you know, and I have this vision of Rodney running around campus with an AK-47, <laughs> chasing a 14-foot reptile across the Commons, right? And we said, is it because it's loose? And we didn't know it's because he does reptile cognition and, and he needs to dissect its brain and shooting it is the only way that it can die quickly enough that he can get something valuable out of the brain. If he kills it in other ways, um, uh, it won't work. He won't have the right kind of specimen. Um, and we dis I decided that I didn't think that discharging a firearm on campus was, was appropriate. And so we said no, but we also just found out later the thing was 12 inches long. And so I don't know how you shoot a 12 inch. No. I, I don't know what you, you know, do you, how you find the stuff to put under the microscope after you do that, right? So, uh, so, so this job isn't all serious, right? And so, the, so, so that's. The memorable moments, I'll, I'll give you one specific one, but then I'll say something very sincerely again. Certainly one of the most memorable moments was watching the sunrise come up over the eastern rim of Mount Kilimanjaro, standing on the western rim at 5.30 in the morning uh, with our two sons and the Drake football team. Uh, we had just, we had spent four days climbing to 15,000 feet. On the afternoon of the fourth day, we had 15,000 feet in our base camp slept or tried to sleep till 10.30 at night. Uh, I wish they gave us something to eat, and then between, so four days to get to 15,000 feet, between 10, 11.30 at night and 5.30 in the morning, you go 4,300 feet of 30 degree slope, of loose volcanic scree and boulders. Uh, it's the hardest thing any of us had ever done in our lives, and I was three times as old as the other people doing it. This is a bunch of Division One football players and a 66-year-old guy. The, the guides were really, you sure you're okay? You know, they were really afraid of us. <laughs> you, know, you know, don't want a dead president on the mountain. Turn it into Russian. Right? Um, <laughs> you know, I never thought of that one before. Um, and it was breathtaking because, because when we got to the, and, and when we got to, um, Gilman's Point, that's not the summit. That's the, the western rim, and that's where we watched the sun come up. And then for those of us who still had some gas left, you had an hour and a half of going around the rim of the crater to get to the highest point. And you saw the picture of us up there uh, at the summit. Um, but I'll tell you, standing there, there was, you know, I was about to say it was an absolutely clear day. It wasn't down on the ground. I mean, the clouds were 6,000 feet below us, right? So it was, um, you felt like your head was touching the sky. Uh, it was just this incredible range of colors, and um, and you had this, it was probably the most spiritual moment of my entire life, because you had this sense that whatever it is you believe in, whether it's Jesus, or Muhammad, or Buddha, or quantum physics, or anything in between, you were a lot closer to it, right? That you were just, you were touching the universe, and, and it was just, I mean, I get goosebumps remembering it. It was just an incredible feeling. But the other old memorable moments, I think, for both Maddie and me, is happen almost every day. You know, it's the interaction with students and, um, and, and finding out who you are and who you want to be uh, and, and being part of this wonderful enterprise of, of helping you launch yourself into your dreams. And, and, and that's the memory we're going to take away from this place of how fortunate we've been to be part of you and part of your lives. Well, thank you so much for sharing those experiences with us. Um, we have a few minutes left for questions from the audience. So you guys have a clear and concise question that you want to ask the president, just raise your hand. Um, we'll have somebody come to you with a microphone. And then before you ask your question, if you want to introduce yourself, that would be great. It could be fuzzy and ambiguous, too. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, we can go that way, Wow. Um, you know, 
it, it's the, the things that were hard to adapt to were the conditions, not, not the culture. Um, the, the culture was wonderful. And, and one, of the, uh, one of the really profound things about, about living in the Soviet Union for 11 months in the middle of the Cold War uh, is that um, the people themselves were so warm and so embracing of us. Uh, and you know, they of all people, uh, you know, we're in the middle of the Vietnam War as well as the Cold War. Um, and uh, we had these experiences every once in a while as part of the exchange. We would get set up to, you'd have to go to a panel discussion with the, with the, the Komsomol, the Young Communist League, uh, and you'd get these really earnest questions. You know, they sort of pound their fist on the table and say, how can you justify what your government is doing in South Asia and bombing hospitals and murdering the North Vietnamese? And I could look at them and say, I can't. And I don't agree with what my government is doing. And I can say that. <laughs> and I'm not afraid. You know? and, um, but for the most part, I mean, we were just in, embraced. You know? I mean, Maddie had somebody staring at her on the street that, that she thought was glaring at her. And, and the woman ran up and handed her flowers. Uh, just it, it, so it, it was tremendously warm, and uh, you know the relationship we had with Mikhail Gromov and his wife Lydia, uh, the way they embraced it, embraced us into their family. Uh, you know, I got a bunch of very talented Russian musicians together with one of the other guys in the exchange. We we had a blues band that was doing, and you know, we had bootleg tapes going around Moscow University. And it was, so I mean, the culture itself. Um, you know, in, in many ways, what was so impressive about it is they were so much more literate than Americans are. And part of it was the imposition of the Soviet education system, which made everybody do everything. But most of the educated Russians I knew knew far more about American literature than most Americans did. Uh, and they knew far more about their own literature than we know about ours and our cultural traditions. Uh, so in, in terms of culture, it was, uh, it, it was easy to adapt to. It's very welcoming. The hard part was um, that the, the Soviet Union in 70, 71, I mean, the, the system doesn't work. I mean, you know what, it, it ultimately, when it ultimately disappeared in 1989, in 90, is because it imploded of its own weight. You know, it just doesn't function as a centralized economy, especially when it's 12 time zones across, um, you know, run by a dictatorship doesn't work. Um, so, you know, you would, you know, if, if we needed toothpaste, you know, Maddie and I would have to decide which one of us is going to spend the day looking for it. <laughs> okay. um, you know, the, con the, the living conditions were harsh. But as foreigners, and, and I think one of the most um, uh, unsettling things was that as foreigners, we were privileged. Uh, one of the real ways that they, they made money was they had what they call foreign currency stores, Berioski, which is the Russian word for Birch Street. And, and so you could go to the Berioska, and, and they had everything, and but as long as you paid for it in dollars, you know, Soviet citizens weren't allowed, it, only Westerners. Um, so if we really needed something, you know, we could go to the Berioska and buy it. Uh, we spent a lot of time going to the Berioska and buying things for our Soviet friends because they couldn't get in there, and that kind of disparity was unsettling. So the hardest part of it was just the harshness of life under those conditions, but, but culturally it was wonderful.
what programs do present, you know, what, what programs does higher education need from us? What publications does higher education need from us? We write them, uh, you know, speak on our behalf. And so that will give me a chance, I think, to, you know, having been a part of all these boards over the last seven or eight years has been give, given me the, the luxury of being part of the national higher education discussion. And I'm really worried about higher education in this country. I'm worried about the, it becoming financially out of reach. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm worried about the sustainability of its financial model, all kinds of things. So if I can be part of that discussion in a helpful way. Um, there are also consulting opportunities on top of that. It's not part of the responsibilities of a senior fellow, but I'm going up to DC in early August to get trained in AGB consulting strategy. So if I want to do that, um, you know, if it's, if it's a particular project that I find interesting or I think will be useful or if I need to buy another guitar. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, beyond that, I want to get better at my guitar. I want to run. I want to get better at tennis. Maddie and I want to spend time with our grandson in California. Um, the two of us want to do things we haven't had time to do together in a long time. So I think we'll keep, keep busy, but not quite as maniacally as we have for the last 16 years.
trying to understand what got her into this horrible situation and saying, why don't you leave here with me and, 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 and I'll, I'll take you and help you live a, a moral and, and, and just life. And, uh, um, and she laughs at him and, uh, and, and he leaves and he goes back to his, the, the, I should warn you, the, the name of the story is a nervous breakdown. Um, he goes back to his, his apartment, his attic, and he starts thinking about what can I do for, to solve this problem? And, uh, um, and he says, okay, well, I can save one person. But there were 35 women in that house, and, and then there are 50 of those houses in Petersburg, and that's just Petersburg, and there are 100 of them in Moscow. And, and by the time he gets done, he has made this a problem that involves tens of thousands of young women all over Russia for which he can do nothing and so he throws himself down the stairs. Um, and, and I'm not saying this again to depress the heck out of you, I'm saying that the, the moral of that story is start at one, you, you do it one person at a time, you know, that, that you don't start by stepping back and say this is too big for me to solve or this is too big for a group of people to solve. But look to say what is it that I can do that's going to take one step towards making this better. And if everybody's doing that, sooner or later it turns into a movement and sooner or later things start to change. And so I think that, you know, the message out of that story is not meant to be a depressing story. It's, it's, it's really meant to say don't, don't let the magnitude of an issue stop you from doing anything. You know, there's, you know, it's not black and white, there's grays. Uh, and you know, you look at each of these things and figure out, first of all, which, which are the ones you care most about, which are the ones that you have the knowledge and skill set to, to help do something about, and take the steps that you can and try to get other people to go with you. Uh, but the real danger is to step back and say, you know, this is, this is, this is so big I can't do anything about it. And, and, and if you sort of, we abandon that accountability, then I think we're in trouble. This is a great question. Well, we're running out of time. So um, on behalf of um, everybody here, as well as all the time on the board, we'd like to thank you for, again, answering all the questions as well as um, um, taking time off your schedule to be here. So, but President Maxwell actually doesn't know um, that we do have one other item on the agenda. Which is surprising that, uh, it doesn't involve a doghouse on Wednesday. No. <laughs>